Good morning and welcome to the show studio. This is our first panel of Men's Way Season, Autumn Winter 2017. And it's a great pleasure to be here in this amazing silver space <laughs> <laughs> and back with the team. Um, and today we're going to be discussing J.W. Anderson. And I think considering what's happening in the world today, it sort of might seem strange while we're all sitting here together discussing fashion, which doesn't seem as important, but I think there's always more to it than it seems on the surface. And in the times when politics is dominated by much masculinity as never before, it's great to discuss different masculinity. So I've got a brilliant set of panelists today to wait in on J.W. Anderson. And could you please introduce yourself, starting from you, Hattie? Hi, I'm Hattie Judah. I'm a writer and I specialise in art, but I sometimes write about fashion as well. Hi, I'm Rosie Wallen. I'm um, a lecturer at Central St. Martins and a researcher as well. Hi, I'm Jan Malcolm Reynolds. I'm an editor, a writer and a researcher at King's College London. I'm Stavros Karelis and I'm the buying director of Machine A Store. Brilliant. And I'm Anastasia. I'm a freelance writer based in London and I'll be chairing a few of the menswear panels uh, this season. So it's actually great to start with J.W. Anderson, I think, because he came out of a London scene and uh, he's seen like one of the most amazing rises in fashion in terms of his career. Uh, he started his business in 2008, as far as I remember, mm -hmm. uh, just three years after he uh, graduated from London College of Fashion. So really it's not that long time in the industry and yet he's sort of the name everybody's talking about so i just wanted to ask your opinion because you probably followed his career from quite early on like what do you think was the key of his success what is it which makes uh, his stuff work so well today anyone uh, <laughs> well you no. mentioned you know, before we started a recording you, you you kind of threw out this idea about what our favorite pieces were and I do remember he did a very early collection where he had these amazing long kilts like ankle length mm -hmm. kilts yeah. and these little mohair mm -hmm. jackets which just had a strip here and a strip at the waist and there was this kind of gorgeous tactility to it but at the same time it had that amazing cut and that really wonderful fluid use of the pleats mm -hmm. so you had both this kind of gender, gender challenge mm -hmm. and a tactility and a sensuality but also incredible tailoring going on at the same time mm -hmm. Um, and I think those things have, have underscored a lot of his best collections, perhaps. For me, it's the same, actually. You know, he's um, an extremely, extremely talented designer, but also what I mostly enjoy about JW is that he creates a whole set of conversation every single time mm. that he um, has a show. And um, perhaps sometimes, you know, it's not uh, everyone is favorite collection but then mm. definitely creates a set of conversation and you can see the skills there, the talent, um, the high quality in garments and clothes but also you know so much of introducing ideas and it's all about gender as well um, who it wasn't a trend back when he did it you know it, he mm. he started doing it um, and uh, then I think so many other people followed uh, and I think the whole world that he's inviting us every single time i think it's definitely one with that creates a whole set of conversation between people and discussing so many different ideas yeah i, w I remember how i interviewed john skelton um the founder of lncc mm -hmm. some years back now i think it was early 2013 and he said jw anderson is the biggest talent we've had in this country since westwood Oh, wow. Thought, wow, that is quite <laughs> <laughs> that is a very big <laughs> <laughs> statement, isn't it? But um, uh, he went on to say what I totally agree with that uh, there is he has his own aesthetic, and mm -hmm. you whenever you pick up a piece, you know it's a J W Anderson piece. Although I'm not entirely sure that I, I agree with the, with the last bit because I to me a lot of his shows. A lot, a lot of what he does is about styling. So actually, if you unpick it into mm -hmm. separate pi pieces, it won't necessarily be quite so recognizable. But I think that in this sense, he was also um, kind of a precursor of a few different things that are happening in fashion now, one of them being the, the gender fluidity and, and that the other one being just this kind of total over-styling, over mix and match sort of take taken to the next level just throw it all in and uh, just throw in a lot of different references from all sorts of sources and uh, don't be afraid to if it does not look particularly pretty 
mm. uh, because I think that I mean to me what Vietnam does for instance is kind of in from the same school of thought <laughs> really <laughs> uh, so I think yeah and I think he started doing it very very early on didn't he from like I think the collection you're talking about was 2009 or so yeah and he was already doing that so. What do you think, Rosie? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I kind of I agree with a lot of what's been said. I think that um, you know, there's lots of routes into into design. One of them is um, to be the stylist and to kind of pull from all of these different references and put them together in challenging ways. And certainly, he does that. Another way would be to go from a sort of more technical and more of a kind of or a conceptual approach. I don't feel that he's he's doing that. I think as you made the connection with Vetmol, they, they have a very similar kind of approach to to design, which is very appropriate right now. Um, it seems to speak to people. And I think what's interesting about kind of um, JW is that he does talk about um, being influenced by other designers, which lots of people uh, mm -hmm. don't like yeah. to talk about yeah. that. Yeah. It's a sort of, you know, uh, we're supposed to believe that it's all just sprung from, from mm -hmm. you know, nowhere. Um, but he's very open about, you know, and is grateful to his references. And I think that's uh, an interesting and modern uh, take. And yeah. therefore, the clothes feel kind of familiar to us mm -hmm. when we're looking at them because we sort of recognise things, but maybe we don't. Mm. at first know where we recognize mm. them mm. from so there's a familiarity in there and a challenge which is interesting but he also is one of these uh, designers that he works always with the same team of people behind him mm -hmm. so it's he never changes the team around him i mean um, the people who do the music the styling everyone mm -hmm. is exactly the same team of people i think since the beginning every time that i see the credits it's always the same set of people that they working with which I think um, helps him and he sets the tone every single time that this is what JW Anderson brand is about. I think he has really this fascinating combination of working in 3D and working with body but also mm -hmm. this his obsession with image you know mm -hmm. the end result which is like head to toe the look the impression you get so I actually wanted to ask you Stavros do you agree with what Jana said about are the pieces really recognizable if mm -hmm. you put this apart? Or is it more about the image <coughs> and the... Now impression? it is, every, I mean, uh, right now you can tell immediately w if uh, a piece is J.W. Anderson or not. Um, uh, I think, first of all, I mean, he has already some signature pieces that everyone knows about and um, they have become obviously his bestsellers and he's internationally recognized about that. Um, he also is super strong in what you said about the the image and you know he does like all these amazing campaigns around him so you know it's very very interesting um point to see because normally the pieces that they go on his campaigns are the ones that they actually uh, are more recognizable and people you know identify and understand them immediately in the collection but when we um in the retail sp in the retail and the shop floor uh people do know immediately what is jw anderson and um you know he has developed uh, all these, you know, very, very smart in terms of like branding and the way that he brands his name uh, and some, you know, um, uh, little kind of gadgets, accessories, his bags, everything is very, very recognizable. That was the JW. thing I think is really yeah, accessories. important is accessories yeah. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah. you know, a, a lot of um, designers have kind of quite separate teams mm -hmm. who do the accessories to do the ready to wear whereas with JW Anderson you have always felt even from the very beginning that the accessories were so integral important. to the whole um, uh, world that he was creating and that's very commercially shrewd as well because yeah. that's where the money yeah. made yeah. so yeah. Interesting. That's why he got the lure job as well. Yeah. Isn't it? Well, it's so been it's been great for both yeah. both parties. Um, mm. This collaboration. I even remember, you know, that the uh, you know Topshop did like a series of collaborations with so many designers, and mm. I think that the JW one was the first one that had such a big impact. I mean, when it was firstly launched, you know, it was people went obsessed about that. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the it, w it was crazy because I was seeing everyone being obsessed about this collaboration, and I think. At least in my memory, since then, no one has achieved something similar. Yeah. It, was also the, it was also the biggest one. Yeah, so the biggest one. And he yeah, wanted yeah. to make it accessible to everyone yeah. so that you could spend £2.50 yeah, and exactly. get a, like, a little bang or... Or the big scarves yeah. that he did. And so he you wanted know, yeah. everyone to be brought yeah. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But then it, it moved to become his own signature, that logo, and mm. he used it like now. I mean, you know, it's, it's his 
signature everywhere. So he's um, he's very very smart in the way of building his own brand, basically. Very very smart. I think he's a really good example of showing what creative directing fashion does today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would, like, would you agree that, let's say, successful creative director is not really designer per se anymore, but more like a curator who mm -hmm. like throws mm -hmm. things together? Yeah, but it's interesting though. How do you keep, you know, how do you remain yourself in this mm. situation when you throw all the stuff together? Well, it's a very fine line, isn't it? Because yeah, as you, as you say, it's where where does it still where does it lose your your own aesthetic kind of sensibility and it becomes a you become a film mark. director. <laughs> 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 Ultimately, I mean, Tom Ford was the first one to kind of do that, wasn't he? Really, I suppose. And uh, mm -hmm. so, okay. if it's about creating your whole world, then. But as, as a Stavros, do you have Loewe in your shop as well? No, we don't. Uh, but I have visited the showroom quite a few times and because we're seeing very close in the collection. And I can see, I mean, with JW and his own brand, you know, what I think about it is that actually he's a very hands-on designer. I don't think that he's so, I mean, obviously he's involved in every single aspect of the creative process in terms of, you know, campaign images, um, music, set design on his shows, the way that he's going to communicate with his own brand. But I think he's one of these designers that he's not just seeing, you know, sitting behind an office and just seeing if some references around him and you know he has another set of designing team to do the job for him but I think that he's a very very hands-on designer um, you can tell that you know he's throughout every season you know he's there with love I think it's um, I mean what you see is still you know Jonathan's talent there but obviously it's a completely different set of company and the way that you know they work with luxury leather goods and mm -hmm. the way that um, this collection has been made and what is the target audience as well because I think that for the brand it's very important to separate somehow and not um, put these two different target audiences in one go. So you know it's a different type of customer for Leva, it's a different type of customer for JW Anderson brand and I think that they want to keep it that way and not connect those two worlds too much. But they do permeate though, it's inevitable. Yeah, 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 of course, of course, yeah. But I mean, I mean as Ralph Simmons and yeah, Dior. Calvin Klein, or Dior, yeah, 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 the same. I think it also Nothing really goes yeah, yeah, exactly. it Definitely. really goes beyond the buying thing, you know, because we all consume it through images we see on the internet. Mm -hmm. Because mm. I think his presence, like online and magazines everywhere, is quite profound. Mm -hmm. Like, and you can instantly say to him, like in like through the objects, through the show he creates, through the clothes. I think it's quite fascinating. Um, so one more thing actually you briefly mentioned before is uh, obviously a big <coughs> thing in fashion now, at least the idea of it is gender fluidity. Mm -hmm. So do you think it is definitely a trend? Do you think it's definitely present? Do you think it's happening? Or do you think it's more like a buzzword? Which well, speaking from the, from the college perspective, from what's happening in, uh, with the students, as we were talking about earlier, it's definitely something that's happening. I mean, in the current crop that are, are coming from my course, it, there are many, many students who are looking at um, genderless clothing or kind of trying to reinvent the way that we uh, think about gender. I mean, I have one student who's actually making her own mannequin, so she's not working on a male or a female mannequin, she's creating her own. That's which very is, interesting. You know, really, so it's a real thing, and I think um, it's quite interesting when you're looking at fashion, especially as a woman now, it's quite sort of polarised. So you've got the sort of Kim Kardashian, very, very, very <laughs> feminised, um, overtly sexual, and then you have a lot of women buying menswear mm -hmm. because they don't want to um, you know be part of that aesthetic and certainly looking at us <laughs> this morning you know we're not doing Kim Kardashian so I think, um, I, think <laughs> I think menswear is is really key and uh, again that links to JW that he started out in menswear that's what he trained in and um, I think this kind of more genderless clothing is definitely a reaction to that very feminized because I, th I find that yeah I, I totally agree with you and I, I just went to the LCF one called the fashion MA menswear oh. show the other Same. day yeah, yeah. and that was definitely very very much going in the proper genderless direction mm. because for a very long time I felt that there was a lot of talk about it but it actually was not about r r about transcending gender it was more about cross-dressing. Mm. There was, I don't know, there were all the tuxedo, tuxedos for women and uh, 
uh, skirts for men, that is not genderless. Mm. Yeah. That is cross-dressing, that is drag. Yeah. Mm. That yeah. is very, very, very gendered. That actually reinforces the gender binary just by kind of... Yeah, I think it's a very important point, this point. one. It's going up to a lot of good level now, which is that yes. it's not actually about that cross-fertilization, but about creating something new, which doesn't necessarily have to be either. Yes, very much. And I, I thought that long before the podium fashion started doing this, uh, the street fashion was doing it just because, you know, when, when everybody was wearing, started wearing sweatpants and uh, mm -hmm. truly, true, really and truly genderless clothing that did not bear any kind of, any, any gender markers at all. And um, I, yeah, I think that podium, like the fashion that we see on the podium is just catching up finally at the moment. And uh, I do like what JW, coming back to the topic of the conversation, <laughs> does um, uh, in that sense, uh, especially in the later seasons, because it's a little bit less obvious. Uh, because I think in the beginning when he started toying with it, it was a little bit more obvious. I mean, put a man in a floral blouse. Yeah, OK, we get it. <laughs> we get the, you get what you're trying to say here. Or put a man in a skirt. Again, quite some time ago now, mm. the, not even the 2013 collection that was made a lot of noise about it but sometime before that he had men in, in black skirts that wasn't quite doing it for me but what he what he is doing now is a lot more subtle I find because when you look at his silhouettes you really can't tell whether they're men's or women's because it's just it's just there's just this kind of subtle hint of femininity in how high the waist is or how fitted the jacket is for instance in, in menswear and um, it also makes us question so what do we regard as feminine? Why do we regard it as feminine? Mm. Why is a fitted jacket more feminine than a more loose jacket? And where, where is this kind of border where it becomes more feminine or, or I mean, not genderly? For me, gender sometimes marks? now when it's at the real extremes of either end, it starts to feel a little bit like drag in yeah, both yeah, senses, yeah, yeah. you know. And there's nothing wrong. I love drag, but um, yeah, it, it, does, yeah. it does feel... Um, not real or mm. it doesn't reflect kind of the world that we live in anymore i mean for me one of the issues that i have with mm. this whole thing about gender fluidity is that it seems to reinforce the fetishization of a kind of teenage body type though as well mm. that although we're all sitting there going oh, 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 kim kardashian women have tits women have asses some women have quite large tits and quite large asses and Great. you can't necessarily <laughs> dress like a teenage boy and look you know alluringly genderless it's you know it, it's it's a look that really works if you're the right body type. I think it works on all body types. You just um, you can end up looking like a kind of human barrel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, it's quite, you know if you're kind of hanging you know quite a masculine shape, so yeah. you know quite a broad shoulder or something. It's it's not necessarily yeah. going to work. Yeah, I guess it's terribly just, well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just Unless gets it's back to Savile Row Taylor. I mean, mm. you know. mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it just like gets back to the eternal obsession with skinniness and youth, which mm. is quite. Mm. I feel like, yeah, the further they try to go away from it, uh, <laughs> they would come back anyway. But I mean, yeah, it's the, the genderless body is the, the pre-puberty body, yeah. essentially. So well, I, yeah, I, think I don't know that it has to be, though. I mean, I think maybe, yeah, initially it, it's seen as this kind of teenage, adolescent kind mm. of feeling. But um, I, I, I've seen kind of slightly more genderless uh, looks on older women and kind of... Mm. It looks great. But I also, from a retail point of view, I mean, when I see customers and the way that they shop, you know, nowadays, I mean, at least to our store, um, it's, I mean, I think there's no subject anymore about if something is men's wear or women's wear. I yeah, mean, I obviously, agree. some, the, you know, this is, and it's, it's um, it sometimes, you know, I find it, I mean, it's, it's very interesting, you know, to discuss about it when, you know, because there's so many different subjects involved on this, on this subject. But when I see it on the daily, basis when people are walking in the store they're going to buy something and they will never ask us if it's menswear or women's wear mm. you know they're going to see something if they like it they're going to put it on also because and i agree with you you know the streetwear culture you know or whatever we put down on the streetwear culture because this is again something extremely generic and takes lots of different meanings and terms right now but um it's it's very generalized but also you know when you see uh, some other brands people do buy and girls buy equally into menswear brands for example 
so many women are buying into Ralph Simmons, you know, and they don't, they're not go they know that it's a menswear design and it's a menswear brand actually, but you know, they're still buying it. And the same, in the same way that guys are buying into typically women's wear brands. And I think it has to do with the silhouettes, it has to do with the way that they fit on the bodies and what does it mean for them, you know, when they wear it. But they will never ask us and that's why we never separated in the store a women's wear section from a men's wear section. Mm. Which is very interesting uh, 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 because other retailers find it mm -hmm. extremely challenging to do that. And I remember, you know, in the past um, when some projects for, um, you know, under the gender identity, you know, were launched, they didn't know where to place them actually, you know, in the stores and or department stores. So they didn't know where actually to position these so kind of Sophie projects. So did a gender, and didn't they didn't they? know where to, to place yeah, it because yeah. it was, uh, for them, I think it was kind of like a new world that they were entering. So they didn't know how they're going like to direct their customers and how they would shop and how they react with these collections because um, they, everyone is used to, okay, this is a menswear shop floor, this is a women's wear shop floor, you know, where we're putting, you mm. know, the collections that is basically, you know, unisex. Um, but I think for smaller stores or someone like, for example, Dover Street, I don't think that there's an issue anymore, you know. But I know when I go on your website, the first yeah. thing it asks me is men's or women's. women's. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. this is tempted to remove And it. I'll tell you, yes, you know, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a big conversation. Yeah. You know what? Uh, you know, <laughs> what is the only reason why most of the online stores need to do like that kind of separation? It's not about where you're going to find the brands you're looking for. It's about basically the sizing. Mm. You know, this is this is what mm. is more important basically because. Um, you can have something that is extremely unisex, but then obviously, when it comes down to sizing, it changes dramatically. That's you know? a so huge issue. This is it's a huge issue. Yeah. I've always felt so lucky that I'm just on the cusp of men's wear, yeah. men's footwear. Yeah, so I can exactly. buy men's shoes. It's so exciting. So this is. So I think this is this is the only uh, thing that actually is is quite important. You know, when when you think about unisex, but then. Going back to J.W. Anderson, you know, uh, also as an experience when you walk in the showroom because at the same time they, they show both together, you know, so they show menswear and they have the women's wear also in the showroom because it's the pre-collections at that point. So they are all under one roof, under one showroom, you can, you know, you can see and you can see probably most of the styles that they're on the women's wear, you mm -hmm. can see exactly the same styles on the men's wear and vice versa, but also uh, some silhouettes, you know, are a bit different, of course. Um, but and maybe that's the, the future of fashion. It is. Maybe it that's is. exactly what we're talking about. I'm very that it confident. Will be, you know, there will be those things that are specific at either end, but then the majority <coughs> will be. But also know, from a production point of view and from a commercial point of view for a brand, this is very, very important because if you think about it, um, the only reason how, and obviously I don't want like, to get like into too much information or over analytical but basically you know with productions you know when they need like to bring like the pricing down or they need like to give the orders in factories you know if they use the same type of fabrics if they use the same type of mm. styles then actually they can hit the minimums which means that you know they can place really big orders which means that the pricing is going to go down yeah this is uh, this is extremely important for brands you know to be able to walk and also to save so much cost because but if not you only cost yeah. sorry to yeah, yeah, interject sorry. and I yeah, know yeah. it's not something that yeah. particularly JW Anderson is interested in yeah. but from a sustainability point of I view agree as well. it's so so important that people start thinking that way mm -hmm. um, and so yeah yeah because you don't cool. just you don't so nothing goes to waste basically. no no yeah. exactly nothing goes to waste and so also yeah it's also a generational thing that I think it's really interesting my sons are completely unabashed about shopping from women's wear departments yeah. they, they're totally comfortable with it exactly most of most of the most of the young people, you know, they, I think everyone doesn't even get into that process of thinking, oh, is it men's or is it women's? Mm. You know, I like it, or you know, I like the whole world of this brand. I'm going to buy it, you know, regardless. That's I quite remember good. reading there's this um, a book. Well, actually, it's a, it's a it's a compendium of four big tomes called "A Hundred Thousand Years of Beauty." Uh, which is uh, yeah, like a collection of essays from academics and not quite academics <laughs> uh, about uh, beauty ideals and body ideals over over the centuries. 
And uh, in the last book, the last, the, the last tome is it's called Future. So it's all projections about, about how it's going to be. And one of the projections, it, it's, uh, they, they just have this kind of imaginary timeline of dates in the 21st and 22nd centuries. When was it written? It was written <laughs> not long ago. It okay, was okay. like maybe 10 years ago max, but I think even, even less so. So um, in the, the, there is this, yeah, the last page with the projection. The future will be silver. <laughs> the future will be silver, <laughs> yes. So, and, then, and one, of the, one of the entries there read, 2051, the EU legis well EU that's still <laughs> seen <laughs> <different laughs> <different laughs> at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The EU legislation scraps the requirement to to uh, uh, state gender in EU travel card in uh, mm. EU ID cards, and uh, that was dated 2051. And when I looked at it, I thought. I think that's going to happen a lot earlier than that. Oh. 2051, seriously, yeah. I think that's going to happen, you know, within the next 10 years. That was a couple of years ago, and soon after I read it, um, New Zealand and Germany introduced the third gender option in their passports, mm. Mm. because gender. you, can, yeah, you yeah. can be M, F, or X, which yeah. means other, anything non M and non F. But I think, yeah, the next step would be just to scrap it altogether, because who cares what gender you are? That's, there are more important things. So I think we steered quite a bit away from GW1 <laughs> because, <Yes. laughs> because the topic is fascinating. But um, I think it's probably about time we'll look at the show. And For sure. I just wanted to bring up one more thing, which yeah. I think is maybe just germane to point out now, that in March he's curating uh, an art exhibition at the Hepworth Wakefield. Oh. And mm -hmm. it's going to be looking particularly at sculpture. So the Hepworth Wakefield is a museum that specialises in sculpture exhibitions. Mm. Um, and he's quite a serious art collector. I've seen him around the oh. and places quite a lot. So he's so it's going to be positioning his <coughs> his own designs and his own investigations of gender and mm. his sculptural forms on the body alongside works of mid twentieth century sculpture. Oh, wow. oh, so I just wanted to put that one out there. Mm, so that's amazing. <laughs> yes, right. I think it's called uh, Disobedient Body as yeah. well, which is quite an interesting title. Yeah. I think it sort of sends you in this direction of. Yeah. That's a great title. Challenging, yeah, isn't it? strange, <laughs> and sad. You wish you'd had a thing. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, let's have a look at the show. And Stavros actually has been to the show. So, yes. could you tell us a little bit uh, how was it? What was the atmosphere? Uh, I think the atmosphere was very, very exciting. And um, the, that collection is extremely, extremely strong. Um, there were many ideas, I mean, very familiar ideas, also, you know, very favorite to Jonathan. Uh, Obviously, crochet was the, the main uh, idea that was going through really heavy chunk knits. Um, these really beautiful trousers, they had like this extra, actually, I don't know if we can see them, but they have like these extra pockets uh, on, the knee, um, on the knees. Uh, it was a great, great show, and uh, actually, all the bags, accessories, backpacks, it was super, super strong. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think that the whole vibe, everyone really loved it. Uh, you can see this really amazing, really long. Uh, scarves, heavy needs, you know, in orange and purple that they showed. Um, it was a very, very exciting show, very exciting show. So could we maybe come back to the beginning and have a look, like, sort mm. of like, yeah, look by looks, look? Uh, yeah. And what, what, what was the press release? What, was, yes, what, that's what were they um, saying? Uh, I, um, you, 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 you called me there <laughs> because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't read the press I release. I like to read the press release. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually read the press, the press release. We might do we have it here or maybe um, not? We can look it up yeah. uh, for like to see what they were saying but about it. Did you, see actually, that, like, did you actually see the sort of preview, which is a, his project with uh, Alice de McLean? Yeah, Alice de McLean, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is kind of this like very full frontal nude photos, very sexy, but very beautiful, very classic sort of. So it's kind of interesting again, because you don't necessarily see it straight away translating into clothes. This is like quite Aquarius actually. You know, he had like Aquarius going on through like his crochets quite a lot. There's something there basically because um, it's yeah, something that probably he feels very strong about. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, no, sorry. Because if you think of like sort of sexiness mm -hmm. in when it's applied to man, it's not necessarily um, the kind of look we think of it when we look no. at this. So. I'm just wondering what those trousers on the right, is, is that a plique? I can't see from here. The, the this ones one. on the right? Yeah, 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 yeah. What is that? Um, oh, that's better. Yeah. Oh, yeah, much better. Oh, that's it sort was of like, like is it a brush? It's a Yeah, it looks like medieval. Yeah. Yeah. They're really, I like those a lot. 
it was very strong. It's like sort of stained glass window chaps. But, but also what we said, sorry, about the, about the, the you know, what we were saying about Alison McClellan also is, is a brand where the live stream they show before from Granger, basically. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. you know, this is, I mean, it's, it's kind of, um, I think he plays quite a lot with that kind of world, in and out. Yeah, it's a bit of provocation, a yeah. bit of sex, but also, you know, it's not, it's, it's a really different take on it when okay. it comes to clothes, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would be curious, just, just like Rosie was saying, saying, to see, see what the what references, the references are, because I mean, some of them you can read, some, mm. yeah. but there are some sort of general yeah. type. Cool. He was doing shirts there, and, uh, yeah, sorry. Because well, because the last women's wear collection he did, there was a lot of medieval references, and, mm -hmm. and although it's not oh, so yeah, much in Tudor, the, yeah, it, I guess it was Tudor more than yeah. medieval. Yes, you're right. Um, but he's definitely done kind of medieval stuff before with a lot of mm. gathering and padded bodices and stuff. And I'm just wondering whether maybe that's yeah, that's slightly carried over because they looked like they were kind of heraldic patches on things. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. Oh, this is pretty really amazing, the, mm. the colour and the, the flow. There Probably was amazing of, when it's not. A lot of yes. knitwear, so the knitwear's really yeah. become yeah, the yeah, focus, yeah. hasn't yeah. it? It seems like knitwear's the focus and sort of... Um, it's quite blankety as well. Mm. Yeah. It's very blankety. It's sort of, in a nice way, a little bit kind of charity shop. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was wondering whether it was maybe thinking about kind of being in a kind of holiday in some little old cottage in the in the British countryside. Feels like that. And you're Feels going like to bed and breakfast local, and you're going to the local church, church shop yeah. in yeah. the church. And you go to the local church and you've got that kind of medieval stained glass. There's and tea and scones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Muslim references now in terms of in, in terms of silhouettes and, and layering and what, the long and is shirts. that one on the end? What's happening there with the scarf at the end? What's the yeah. embroidered things underneath? That one, yeah. Is it possible to go through the silhouettes in kind of um, close up one by one? it's quite hard to see on the little screen. Yeah, but I think yeah. the Muslim reference is something he's been doing for a long for time. For a long time, yeah, yeah, exactly. extended. I mean, like, when you were talking before about having these um, non-binary garments as opposed to things that look more like drag, I think that a, lo a lot of people are drawing on the Far East and the Near East and mm -hmm. creating yes, kind of long Yes, a lot of them are very, much, very much are, absolutely. See, I mean, that's that could be for men or women, really. I mean, most of these outfits could be, couldn't they? They feel very. Um, it's, and it's so funny that something even like a knotted sweater that turns into another thing has become the signature that's been there since mm. its very earliest collections. And it's a that kind. That was really beautiful as well. Yeah. It's quite interesting to see that um, although knitwear, we still see a lot of this uh, oversized, which is like, you know, the long sleeves, mm -hmm. which is sort of has become almost, I don't know, it, I think I feel it's on the way to becoming a cliche, basically. And it's interesting well, to so see it still here. Yeah. That's the point, yeah. isn't it? They're really hard to wear. I'm forever flinging. Yeah, but also I feel kind of like it's wearing off in terms of it's, um, mm. you know, it's not that surprising anymore. Mm. So it's interesting to see him sort of um, use different thing to express the same. But also I think that this is obviously the show, so when once you're in the showroom, I think that there's always a set of other com more commercial pieces based on mm -hmm. the ideas. Mm -hmm. So perhaps it, it's not, they're not going to be like as big as and chunky as so they show. It's what mm -hmm. you're wearing a version of the one that was down to the knee. It is this one actually, year. but I have to pull it down. <laughs> so it's no, up. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, um, no, it's the same one, but you know, he's got the, as most of these designers, you know, um, also when you go to the showroom, they've got the catwalk pieces because lots of customers and lots of buyers are shopping based on what they see on the catwalk. But then there are some versions of them, which is the more, you know, commercial ones, let's say. Yeah, so you can wear them. But actually, if you put, I mean, you can, this is quite easy, but if you push it down, yeah. It's the easy. Your <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But it's um, going back to what you were saying, I think before mm. we even started the, the discussion mm. properly, it's going to be interesting, the pricing of these yeah. jumpers, because yeah. and especially the if they're hand-knit. The crochet, yeah. Yeah. The crochet is uh, they're, they're very, very beautiful. But I mean, I think that, however, I think that someone with the experience of uh, Jonathan, and I think, you know, with the way that his brand right now is and the right business and backup that he's got, um, these are, by the way, the trousers that I was talking about. Mm. I mean, this is, I think, a theme that was going through probably most of his trousers uh, throughout the show. But going back to what you said, is that 
Um, I think that they have already gone through that. They're extremely well prepared. I mean, as soon as the show finished, I went on Instagram and I saw that they have launched already uh, shots of the accessories. You know, they're launching it SAP. So it's one of these brands that they have extremely well thought about every single process. So immediately after the show finished, very smart and very cleverly because they know that Evan is going to visit their website or their the Instagram. Key, I think that's the key to his success yeah. actually is the integration yes. of accessories. I know I've said that, yeah. I'm going to say it again. I think he's really thought that through um, and maybe working with Lueve as well has yeah. kind of galvanized well, I mean, that. <coughs> you can see like on his Instagram for example, you know, immediately uh, after the show they launch uh, the, the bugs basically mm. so you can see the product shows of the bugs mm. um, so people are going to start requesting them SAP and this is the whole point of it <laughs> I mean so it's a great like business planning. It is, it is. Mm -hmm. but March, it? Like Since what? 2014. Oh no, just this year, wasn't it? Or no, 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 I think it's the start of 2014 or 14, 13. Yeah. So I'd imagine that there is probably a lot of mentoring going on there in terms of, of but selling. It, it'll be I, but I mean, I'm, I'm, which is not to take it from, from, from him. I'm sure that he's pretty savvy himself. But I think there's going to be something him. interesting will happen then because mm. it's also to do with the scale of a business, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So at the moment he ha has his business which is a certain size and then Lueve. Um, but I wonder what will happen now with this LVMH money, whether mm. it will you know, get bigger and what, will, what the change will be. Mm. Um, because you've seen it with Vatmore, it's become, you know, I mean, it's a different creature. Yeah. It's interesting that he didn't go straight out and launch a shop, which mm. is what other people might have done. Mm. You know, he did that pop-up, didn't Very he? smart. Yeah. yeah, very smart. It's very smart comment, actually. Yeah. You know, he's one of the very, very few that they didn't go into like his own yeah. uh, retail. I mean, he, he's got kind of like an ongoing collaboration with um, the space next to Ace Hotel, you know, which is his mm. pop-up store. And I think he's launching the most uh, special projects that he does with Michael Car Clark and you know like all these like different kind of little projects that he does he's you know just, around. He's just done the takeover of a new store in Milan yeah, as well, yeah. so Milano, yeah. which I think he b where he brought some objects from mm. the workshops as well, yeah. which is again sort of goes back to our uh, conversation about him being a, a bit of a curator. Mm. And mm. Yeah, so it's more curator, not mm. just brand, yeah. just the whole universe yeah. Yeah. from which you also can buy whatever you like, which mm. is pretty great. Yeah. Yeah. So coming back to the show, I think maybe uh, each of you could sum up a few points which stood out for you, what you liked, what you didn't like. Touching my stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 did, I did really like the um, big knits and uh, the chunky knits. I think, you know, the big scarves. He, it's something that he has done a few years ago, obviously in different variations, but they were extremely, extremely popular. I think the trousers are going to be very, very popular with him. 100% the accessories, bags and backpacks. And um, I think he played quite a lot with print. You know, you can see the t-shirts, the long sleeves, the way that he's layering all these um, tops, which I think also they're going to be very, very popular. And I think, and I'm guessing, that this is also a great way of him introducing a few ideas for his upcoming women's wear show. Uh, because he's going mm -hmm. to try and see, you know, which of these elements he's going to imply into uh, the Women's Wear show that is coming in February. Um, but overall, I thought that it's a very, very uh, interesting show, very, very exciting one, and it's, um, again, something that is very recognizable. And I think his customer, his type of customer, is going to go for these pieces because they would like to wear them, go out, and people, other people would understand immediately, this is J.W. Anderson. There's some very serious outerwear going on there, isn't mm -hmm. there? Yeah. With calfskin. Yes. And, uh, which I don't remember him doing before. What did he? I mean, um, I probably know his collection was better. Than yeah. No. He he has done. He has done. Perhaps you know he has showed them in a different way on the catwalk. So maybe mm -hmm. that's why it wasn't as memorable to everyone that he has done them. But actually, in the show we can uh, you can see quite a lot of like outerwear going with you know with. Uh, leather and really good quality of fabrics. He's, he's always, his, his quality is amazing. He's, like, his level is a great high-end brand level, basically, so, yeah. Yeah, this, this look actually, it's the... beautiful, man. Yeah, I, th I, I think that this is probably going to be the look, the most cited look, the most, the most reproduced look, uh, one it's of right. the most reproduced look, looks of the whole collection. Yeah, I, um, I, I mean, to me, it is, again, as we were saying earlier, that this show, kind of continues to 
uh, disseminate the our right, kind of the, the ideas of J. W. Anderson mm. that we all have of uh, uh, yeah, just kind of quoting a lot of different sources and uh, uh, a lot of oversize and uh, uh, kind of playing with uh, uh, with gender. Some of some of them are a little bit overstyled for my liking. Some, I mean, sometimes, uh, but that's, uh, I'm talking as somebody who wears clothes now rather than who's, as somebody who thinks about clothes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, sometimes I think it, it, it can be a little bit, I mean, he can, he does do overkill and sometimes he probably does it deliberately. Um, but in most cases, it's, um, it actually really works. And I think that's what, what one of the reasons why this look uh, with the, the long sleeve sweater with the, well, patch on the front works so well is that it's quite it's actually quite graphic mm. uh, although there is a lot going on because there's a patch and there's like long sleeves and that's a very oh, kind of wide slightly Oxford bag type from what I can tell mm. uh, trousers um, but uh, and it's uh, what I what I like about it I guess is the, the, uh, the new silhouette because that is what mm. uh, is exciting about fashion and that is what you very often do not get uh, you get new colours, you get new uh, details, but uh, actually getting a new silhouette. Is so particularly, which which ones? Well, even the, uh, again, even sort the, of this really oversized. Yeah, they really they uh, the really oversized one, the really oversized jumper with the oversized uh, uh, trousers. Um, well, yeah. Talking about this. Is it is it, that <laughs> is, it, is it still that new though? Is it still does it still feel challenging um, to you? Maybe not. Uh, maybe not to us. But I think oh, more to the, the people who are going to wear it. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. And maybe not to Stavros' customers. Yeah, because we, we experienced that, you know, with, for example, Rob Simmons, you know, oversized jumpers, he's doing them for the last two, three seasons. And, you know, remember, That's you know, the first favorite. time customers came in to try them, you know, the, the way that they felt about it and, oh, how can I wear this? This is like too big. And especially when we tell them they were coming, they're saying, can we have like one size smaller? We said, all of them are coming in one size. So <laughs> everyone was like shocked that everything was in one size because obviously um, it couldn't go bigger, <laughs> but definitely could go smaller. Uh, however, you know, they, they got used to it. So I think it's, it's going to be very interesting to see like how this is going to be, um, yeah. So I guess it changed with trickles down from innovative ideas on the catwalk and mm -hmm. then into like more day-to-day -day wearing retail experience is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, Ro Rosie, what oh, stood sorry. out for you in the show? What well, did you like? I definitely, it was those embroidered trousers with the kind of bomber jacket, mm -hmm. which is funny because it's not uh, the oversized look. Um, I just, I really liked that play on, well, it felt like a play on Britishness. I'm not sure which what the... It, it, like it was the third or the fourth, I think it was yeah, the fourth, like it was right in the beginning actually, so if we, if we scroll down a bit, it's the one with the bomber jacket, I think. But maybe that's just because it was a little bit more, it was closer to the body, I, I quite right. liked that, um, right. being yeah. able to see the body a little bit more, whereas these kind of very large oversized things kind of a bit tent-like, but there were good uh, details, interesting details. Yes, there's lovely um, pockets, and lots of that beige piece, yeah. Mm, I loved all those pockets. But it was definitely that one that I thought was I think the yeah. most interesting one. Yeah, we've lost it now. Yeah, we lost <laughs> it. We'll find it. I think it's a bit lower. Higher, yeah? I think, it was in the be I think it was in the beginning that they showed this look. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, th I think it's very funny. That's what I like about it. It's very funny. That, very good. Uh, we that it. is very true. It's, it's yes. kind of got a very yeah, humor is not comedic with element. Talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the right hand side. Yeah, yeah, the right one. The one I it's almost it's kind of childlike. A lot of it, isn't it? It's a lot of it. Could, is almost kids wear. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and that is another way of doing genderless, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. kids wear is, is not gen. Well, okay, no, no, now all the kids wear all the for for girls it's always in pink, so it is gendered. <laughs> but oh. generally speaking, kids wear is not gendered at all. And uh, yeah, there is a lot of fun and kind of care carelessness, carefree kind of vibe to it, which is which is very nice. And which again, from what I can tell, was present in. Uh, one collections men in what what I saw photos of yesterday mm. and uh, today and the shows that I saw. So what do you think, Hetty? Well, going back to your opening comments about the world being in a very traumatized state, I think this is a, co a collection that's a lot to do with 
comfort mm -hmm. actually and all of these oversized it's mm -hmm. quite protective and swaddling yeah and it feels like it's you know you're almost wrapping yourself up in blankets and those great big outsized teenage jumpers you know where you've got your hands covered and you're mm. all huddled up together it's very english yeah very <laughs> english and, and it and, and for me it has got that slight kind of play on as we were saying earlier kind of staying at some b and b with crocheted blankets or a and camping and trip in yeah like sort of cotswolds <laughs> and, and being somewhere that's <laughs> slightly away from it and timeless and mm -hmm. That, that was the kind of feeling I was getting. I mean, I think it's really beautiful and there are some absolutely gorgeous pieces this, in there the, as well. So the red and yellow colour blocking sweater is mm. this really quite beautiful. But it's also incredibly casual and very relaxed and very easy to wear without actually being streetwear, which is something that's <laughs> unusual. Uh, that is a very good point. Actually. That is a yes. good point, yeah. Great. So do you think he's coping well with the challenge of growing and becoming sort of more appealing to a mm. wide audience? Yeah, I mean, yeah. you uh, sometimes, I mean, obviously it's better for every single business and every single brand to get more and more customers and have a wider audience, but also is challenging to satisfy your current customers yeah. and, you know, keep them always happy and keep them to be loyal to you. So I think he's, he's having a great balance of keeping his already existing customers uh, close to him but and satisfy them, um, but also, you know, to gain a bit of a new audience uh, which is very very difficult also because when you see a collection which has quite a lot of like heavy and chunky needs and mm. has you know quite a lot of outerwear um, in an international market where it's like as Asian market with like different climates and different type of um, th the shopping the buyers shop very very differently uh, because of the different weather conditions you know that exist worldwide so I think taking all this into consideration I think there are like so many styles in this collection where when they dissect them mm. you know everyone is going to be very very happy about yeah I remember reading an interview of his uh, I think it was from 2016 uh, on uh, business of fashion where he says uh, people don't come to us for a little black dress <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that's not what people are looking for at JW Anderson so uh, it's better to give them what they do come to us for as in mm -hmm. ideas uh, so from that point of view, well, I th yeah, as Savros is saying, it's uh, uh, sometimes uh, for a designer like him, I guess it's focusing on your exist on your core customer is uh, a lot more important than trying to lure more people in because I mean he he's Marmite, isn't he? He's, there are people who will oh, right. never buy into him whatever he does. But then do you think he does that more successfully in menswear than women's wear? That was one of the things that we were thinking about, yeah. wasn't it? Because mm. he came from menswear and it. For me, it feels like it, it happens more in men's wear. Interestingly, women's on that, that same occasion when I was talking to John Skelton uh, from LNCC, he said to me that for him, it was the women's, it was wear. The women's wear that mm, did it. Interesting. Uh, for him, it was because I think because uh, uh, maybe because he was he expects a bit more tailoring from men's wear. Mm. So, uh, yeah, which he was not no, getting no. from JW, <coughs> obviously. But he, for him, when he was talking about this being the biggest designer, the biggest talent since Westwood, he was referring to the women's wear, uh, which I found quite interesting because, especially at the time, at the women's wear, I thought he was still finding his feet with it. Mm. It was 2000, early 2013, so he'd only been doing it for a couple of years, and it wasn't. But I think oh. it's like men's wear is just feels a bit newer in Russia these days. Mm. So. I mean, I feel but we could. Were generally, yeah, yeah. You mean, you I feel we could talk about this forever, but unfortunately, we're running out of time. <laughs> so let's give J. W. Anderson a round of applause. Thank you. Sir. <laughs> Thank you.